So, we've, uh, so I work for Australian Country Choice and I run a division of Australian Country Choice um, Australian Cattle and Beef Holdings. So we're a fully integrated beef supply chain to a domestic supermarket in Australia. Um, the ACBH side of the business where the, we breed uh, the, some of the animals and we background them um, for ACC and then we feed them back into the ACC feedlots and then they kill them at our plant in Cannon Hill. Um, so ACC and ACBH cover about 5.2 million acres throughout Queensland. We have a standing herd of about 250,000 head of cattle. We've got 50,000 head feedlot capacity in our three feedlots. Uh, we, our prim primary processing capabilities, we do about uh, 345,000 head per annum, 88,000 tonne of carcasses, 28,000 tonne of offal, and 27,000 tonne of export per annum. Further processing, we value add 13 million kilos per annum of beef and we retail ready 16 million kilos per annum. So we are very much a, a, a fully integrated supply chain for the domestic market. What that means to us is that f from a breeding perspective, I think we should be looking at the, where we start breeding and how we breed and what we're breeding. But the reality is I need to go back to the meatworks and get them to tell me what their customer wants. And it's pretty scary when you're looking at a, at a three to four year change in your, in your herd to get what the customer wants. And if any of you eat, have eaten in high end or low end restaurants, the customer really sometimes doesn't know what he wants. So sometimes when they come back and give us feedback, we start the chain to, to make things work and we traditionally we haven't really known where we're heading or where we're going. So as a company, we had a desire that we wanted to know more about the supply chain and what changes incrementally, whether they were big or small, it meant to every section of our business. In the, pro in the processing side of our business, we capture every piece of data from the animal from when it walks into the knocking box right through to when the last bit of cling wrap goes on the last piece of meat or the last container's packed to go export. So the data that's in the factory at that end is, is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's truly big data. What we probably didn't do so well, we didn't analyse it. We kept it, we stored it, but we didn't analyse it so well. So they, they started analysing the big data in the factory, which then gave us a pull-through effect. They wanted to know more about what we were doing in the feedlots, on the backgrounding properties, and then back to the breeding properties. So the ACC and ACBH supply chain is documented on this map. We own two large breeding properties in northwest Queensland. Those cattle are then fed. So the AC, sorry, the ACBH supply chain is the green, and then we feed down into the uh, ACC model, which is the which is the blue. So in ACBH, we breed them on the two big breeding properties, and then we feed them down into central Queensland on four properties where we background them. We try and turn off every animal between 360 and 380 kilos. We predominantly feed the ACC supply chain, but but animals do fall out of spec. Um, because we operate two large breeding herds, we also produce some high Bos syndicus content animals, which we don't consume in our own supply chain, so we export those through, through Townsville. We then have surplus cows, so uh, breeding cows that are cull for age. We feed those through the, the meatworks from Townsville, Bowen and Rockhampton. Uh, once the background of cattle have reached their weight on the backgrounding properties, they're then fed into one of the ACC feedlots. We predominantly go to the April Creek feedlot. They're then finished there um, between 60 to 70 days and then fed down into Cannon Hill. The ACC supply chain is predominantly purchased cull females from northern New South Wales right through the, to the middle of the Territory and they then bring those cattle in background them through the, the system to the same turnoff weight and then down through Brindley Park feedlot and into Cannon Hill. So on the breeding um, properties that we own, we try and keep the data as simple as we possibly can. In fact, at the moment it's so simple we don't capture very much at all because the hardware and the setups to, to capture what we want has been cost inhibitive. 
and Sean touched on it, the, the connectivity at the moment has made it so it's not worth it for us. So we're not getting real-time data. So we, are, we capture basic um, uh, data through manual forms of capturing them. We like to capture how many cows are in each paddock, how many calves we brand out of each paddock, the pregnancy rates in each paddock. We then have started to selectively graze um, pregnancy status animals in the same paddock so we get a clearer turn off of the age of the animal when it's born on the breeding properties. All our calves are NLIC are tagged um, at birth and we grab the weaner weight as a group when they go through Cloncurry coming to us. So we average our weaner weights out. That gives us our weight of every animal turned off on our breeding properties. The other big thing we manage through manual is our genetic mix. When ACBH was, uh, was formed with the Acton Land and Cattle Company, we had a very diverse herd of breeding cattle. We had a fantastic herd of breeders, very fertile, but they didn't suit a domestic supply chain. They were a 100-day type animal. So quite quickly, we had to work out what genetics we needed to convert that herd back to a yearling type animal. In my opinion, the beauty of a yearling type animal is you can 100 day feed it or you can short feed it whichever way. If you've got a 100 day bred animal, you're stuck in that box. So we studied the genetics of the, of the herd that were, we inherited through the bulls that the Actons had been buying and their selection of their cows. And then we fed in a genetic mix of young bulls through our heifers to try and get a yearling weight animal. So the first of those animals, uh, is coming through our backgrounding system now. So we're, it's very pleasing to see those animals coming through and we're measuring their... Oh, well, I'll, I'll get, sorry, I'll get to that. So once it gets to backgrounding, we do have crush height computers on our backgrounding properties and we're, we were using a, an off-the-shelf program and it was too cumbersome for us. It did too much for what we wanted it to do and it got too confusing for the guys at crush side. Um, it gave them too many options when we wanted to capture data. So we had to analyse the data we needed to make decisions and we worked, it out, we worked out that we only needed to capture seven pieces of data. So we capture seven pieces of data, of, of data on the animal when it's inducted and then every time we do a, a um, tick control measure on it or a check way, we capture the same, not the same seven pieces of data, but the same fields of the data. So it, as it goes through, and, and typically on a backgrounding place, We'll, process, or we'll handle those animals four times. So, we've, so we can very accurately start to pick um, what the weight gain's doing and then where those animals sit um, from a paddock production point of view. We've now put in place automated drafting systems purely based, or we're starting to put them in, purely based on weight and performance. We're kicking out our poor performing animals all the way through the system and we... When, when I say kick them out, they don't go back into their home paddock, they'll go to somewhere where we can push them through the system because we want to capture that yearling animal. We then put them into the feedlots, um, as I said, between 365 and 385 kilos. The feedlots are where traditionally the data started to be get captured. So they capture the data on the, on the live animal on induction through checkways. Every time the animal's fed, the data's recorded. What it's fed's recorded any health issues the data's recorded. So we're now starting to get a pattern of um, a lot of data getting captured. We then, when it goes through the meat, back into the meat works, uh, everyone in the room is probably aware that we get all our kill data back from the, from the meat works and there's a lot more we can get if we ask the right questions about our meat works. That brings us to what we started to look at was all this data we captured but we weren't getting any smarter on how to analyse the data. So we had big data in a pastoral environment and we didn't really know what to do with it. So we coupled with MLA and Hitachi to try and design a system or a platform where the data got sucked into the platform and it started giving us some tangible management results. We then took that a little bit further with Hitachi um, and the beauty of, of coupling with someone like Hitachi is that they are global and they are in every facet of technology in the world. From articulated dump trucks in mines to widgets in the back end of your washing machine. So when we sat down with what we thought were mind-blowing things to, for them to capture data on, 
the guys just said, oh, we capture that in a mining truck or we've got that in some other form of technology. So they started to bring that across to us. So we now capture, through the Hitachi use of technology, all our past, um, sorry, all our water uh, volumes, so how much water we're using. We capture the um, soil moisture, the ambient temperature, the rainfall in different areas, and that then just feeds into the, the Hitachi platform to start letting our managers make decisions based on what's actually happening. happening. So what it's done for us in the time we've been doing it, it, it is that we're now making very informative decisions, particularly on our, on our backgrounding properties and in particular where we're doing the trials at Croydon. So instead of going into the paddock as we used to and have a look at the animals and the pasture and th work out there was a change, it was telling us within a time frame where we could actually make decisions and the result of what we've seen is that we're getting a, a more consistent rising plane in nutrition through the animals. One of the great learnings that I've had out of being involved with ACC and the Meatworks is that if your animals aren't on a rising plane of nutrition, your meat eating quality won't be very good. So a big index for us in our business is the EQI and we measure all our animals based back on that and then we're now going in retrospect and having a look at what their life looked like through our supply chain. Um, yep, thank you.